Today's participants are Eric Johnson, Marshall Shimke. We join their conversation in the faculty lounge. It's a sort of psychology micro level things, and I did more organization design strategy kinds of things. So jointly, we filled two of the four needs they had for the core doctoral courses um, down here. And so it ended up we, we finally found a place that kind of wanted us both equally right, rather than, okay, we really like what you do a little more, we like what you do a little more, and it's been just a really terrific fit. I mean, mm -hmm. it just, just couldn't have been better. No, that is fortunate. Yeah. yeah. So where are you from originally? Indiana. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So Born and raised in Indiana. Indiana. Big Ten uh, Went to territory. Purdue. Sorry, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're real Big Ten school. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and spent a number of years there. And, and, um, and then uh, actually I came down to Orlando and worked at uh, Martin Marietta, which is now oh, yeah. Lockheed Martin, yeah. and did my master's in the evening at UCF mm. uh, back in the 80s. Mm. Um, and then the defense industry started to slow down a bit. Mm -hmm. And so then I decided to leave uh, that company and go and pursue my doctorate and had a real nice opportunity at the University of Alabama at Huntsville mm. in, in optics um, to pursue my doctorate and get paid full time. And, mm and kind of a fellowship type of thing. Yeah. So I took it um, and then went into the commercial side after that. Hmm. So then you were you were sort of in practice both before and after your doctorate? I worked all the way through. Yeah. The yeah. PhD, oh, so you, which you were- Which is quite rare, yeah. quite rare. Um, and uh, so I probably missed some of the fun things yeah. that most <laughs> grad students get to do, but um, I think it, it, was, it was good from the standpoint is it helped me understand technology and, and how to take technology from just the basic research side to more the applied side, and then, you know, how do you use the technology? So certainly I'm more of an applied scientist than mm -hmm. I am a basic scientist, but I think it was very fortunate that I was able to do that. I think our students would uh, would question you on whether there is any fun side if you're not working <laughs> full time. It's one of the adjustments that I've, uh, <clears throat> it's kind of fun to see them make is when you, when you have just started a, a doctoral program like we have here, they don't really have a peer group to relate to from mm -hmm. previous generations. I mean, they come in and maybe there's, um, our first class is just getting ready to graduate now. Um, and so they don't really have anyone to look to about, you know, what's this life supposed to be like? So all mm -hmm. they have is us and we get to tell them what we think their <laughs> life is supposed to look like. It's basically, this is everything in your life for the next, uh, for the next five years. What do, you, what do you have for grad programs in Creole? We have, uh, we're just a master's and PhD program yeah. in, in optics yeah. um, and so, we have about 130 grad students, oh, really? 130 to 150, mm -hmm. plus or minus 20, depending on the time of year it is when they graduate or come in. So we have a quite a few, but we don't have an undergraduate program. How many of those are doctoral rather um, than they masters? For the most part, I'd say 100 of them are coming in in the doctoral program. Really? And we, wow. we pretty much admit them with a fellowship with the hope that they do pursue the PhD. And mm -hmm. certainly sometimes they don't make it through the qualifying or they decide mm -hmm. they just want the master's and, and terminal master's degree and go mm -hmm. out. I'd say probably 80 plus percent of our students do go on and finish their wow. PhDs. And how long does it take them to do that then? Mm, it varies. Sometimes, some cases it can be four and a half years up to six years. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm sure they'd like it to be yeah. four years. <laughs> yeah. But I think what's most important is that they make a contribution to the field. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and as long as they do that, I think that really is more important than anything else. Yeah. And that's what we're there to do is help yeah. them, give them the tools so they can make that contribution yeah. and go to their next yeah. step. You said you're, um, you've been a very applied kind of guy. Is that true for the whole program, or do you have both sort of basic research as well as Our, our program applied? spans basic research all the way up to very applied. Um, um, I think a lot of the activity in the, in the late 80s or in the 80s when the, the Creole started, which, is tar which was a center at first before it became mm -hmm. a, a school, then a college, was, was started out very applied, the need to have laser scientists in the region. And so it started mm -hmm. out with some a lot of applied push. So. I think what makes our program unique is, 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 is it's very integrated with industrial needs and things like that, and that's, I think, help, has helped drive our program. But we do have a lot of research on the basic science side also. So we cover kind of the full spectrum from science to applied science to engineering, which is what's kind of unique about our college versus a traditional electrical engineering department or yeah. physics department. We kind of span the whole, the whole, the whole range of so is it in, in terms, I know it's incredible, I was on the research council for a couple mm -hmm. of years and watched a lot of the research grants come through and that right. sort of thing. 
Uh, I'm always just amazed at what goes on over through um, all several of the kind of technical schools mm -hmm. and and, uh, and and divisions and things. Um, but I know it's incredibly expensive to fund that stuff. Do you guys, do you have sort of ongoing partnerships with Lockheed and folks like that, or is it governmentally? Yeah. I think a lot of it's governmentally, yeah. but, but also the state has been, I, I think, very good in terms of matching programs. And so to entice both uh, equipment donations, equipment grants, and in large funded projects, the state has a very good program set up with industry in, this, hmm. in the state, like uh, Unaxis over in Tampa. Um, they're able to put money in, because I think it's a tax deferment. Instead of paying the tax, they can put oh. the money back in the university and then the state matches it. So there's a lot of activity like that that really goes into it to help basically double or triple the seed funding that you might get from an agency or a program. Hmm. Um, but we do rely heavily on the federal government in buying new, new pieces of equipment and donations from people like Lucent or they became a gear, I guess. Hmm. Um, so we really try to work all angles, so to speak, because it is expensive to do the research. And if what we're going to do is going to be unique and make an impact in the international community, then we have to have the investment in the capital right. the infrastructure. Right. Um, and that's something that the university has been committed in. in How about the grad students then? Do you have outside funding for them as well, or does the... Yes, yeah. anywhere from the National also has Science to be, Foundation, yeah. DOD, you name it. Yeah. Predominantly, it's all, it's all funded externally. Yeah. For the and, without, and without an undergrad program to sort of... like. Uh, Many of our doctoral students spend about half of their fellowship time teaching classes, so we at mm -hmm. least, you know, we get some productivity back out of them on that side in addition to their right. their research, so they can sort of help pay their way in a sense in the college. Apparently, I mean, if you don't have undergrad programs, that's a little tougher for them to do right. that. Then. And so, it, so what what it does is it, it forces them to get into the research lab yeah. sooner, yeah. which in some sense it's good, in some well, sense it's bad. So yeah. The bad part is I think they miss the interaction with the other students yeah. and they miss getting the appreciation for. The, what it takes to teach and to educate and things mm -hmm. like that. But it does get them closer to the research earlier on. So that first year of the program, they come right in and start getting into the research. So mm -hmm. they're all funded on research assistantships and fellowships. Figure out whether yeah. research is for them or not. Uh, exactly. We, that's exactly. one of the big hurdles we have to get over is a lot of people come into a PhD in business and they think of it as just sort of a super MBA, you know, that I was mm -hmm. pretty good as an undergrad, I was pretty good as an MBA, and now I'm going to take that next step and they think it's going to be a similar thing when in fact it's really right. all about doing research and it's much more of a one-on-one -on -one mentorship kind of right. thing rather than uh, just sitting in classrooms and reading books and taking mm -hmm. tests and things like they took before. What of, of the, the students that are in the doctoral track, what percentage of them will then land back in industry as opposed to going on to academic jobs? Well, we're, we're, we're not, a, we haven't been around that long, so I'd say maybe five, what, five or six or seven years we've had our PhD, but before that we were, we were made up by the physics department, the engineering department, mm -hmm. those sorts of departments, so it's really hard to say, but for the most part, academic jobs, are uh, they're more competitive, there's not mm -hmm. as many of them to get, so certainly a lot of them will end up in, in, in research centers, you know, government labs, and industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, as of course the industry, uh, as it fluctuates, the need for PhDs in basic research and industry fluctuates because right. that's a longer term investment. So it kind of goes up and down, but we, we've seen excellent placement of the students. Um, and, and I say that we've done quite well considering the, the, the age of the program overall compared to the more traditional programs in Arizona and Rochester. Right. Right. We certainly are on par with them already. Yeah. And that's tough to crack. I mean, it's, you know, we, we go to our conventions and things, and it's kind of fun to finally start being the folks who are getting the phone calls from other schools about, you know, we've got doctoral mm -hmm. students you should be looking at and, and that sort of thing, but it takes a while for your reputation to sort of catch up with the, the quality of work that you're doing um, in the department. Is your, is your grad program about the size you want it to be, or will it grow larger? Well, as we or bring more faculty, I yeah. assume it will, it will, it will yeah. grow larger. I mean, that's, that's kind of... Um, what, we're, what we're always pushing for, and we do have some more faculty positions that are open right now, oh. so we will expand it, and obviously, and bring in some more students to support it. I think there's, I'm not sure what the number is, but there's some mean level of students that a, that a faculty member can support yeah. given an average level of funding. Yeah. And I think if you go too far past that, you, they could throw things out of balance, so you want to kind of hit the optimal yeah. Yeah. Uh, peak performance level for the faculty and the students and the interaction, because you get too many students, you can't have the interaction with the faculty. So tell me about what you do. I know I was right. noodling around on your web page and I understood virtually none of it. <laughs> uh, I saw a lot of really interesting terms and a lot of terrific looking science. So tell me, I don't understand tell me either. what you do. <laughs> um, well, predominantly what, what I do is, is a little different than what other people do. Uh, and if you think about photonics, a lot of people are optics. A lot of people, right. when they think of optics, 
they think it's some crazy professor in a lab with a gigantic laser on this big optics yeah. table with all these mounts and stuff. But what we do is a little bit different. We say to ourselves, now how do we take that lab table system, that optical system for sensing or communications or whatever, now how do we put it down into a chip, just like the integrated circuit industry did in, mm. in, the, in the 50s and the 60s? Because you remember the old TVs, you know, back in 1950 or 60, there were tubes. Right. And they went from the tubes into the integrated circuit era. Well, optics is very much the same, but it's like 20 to 30 years behind where the electronic industry is. And so what you're seeing now is, is all these components, these discrete optical components, are being miniaturized further and further. So what's an example of a component that would have been, what's analogous to a tube in optics, and then what does that look like now in terms of a chip? Well, what that would what that would be would be, I, I brought a sample. Oh, there we you. go. <laughs> you can't leave home without it. Um, but the, the main key is, 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 is when it comes to making optical components, is how do you make optical components at the chip level, just like they do integrated circuits. Right. So if you think about at the chip level, it's like wafers. This is a glass wafer, okay. just like your glasses are made of glass or, or a, a high-index polymer. Um, but what you want to do is you want to do the same thing the ICs are made. You want to do it all on wafer form, so you can use the same equipment that's in the integrated circuit industry. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done at Creel in the College of Optics is we've made an investment in infrastructure and equipment and people to be able to manufacture optical components at the chip level. So we can take these architectures for the sensing and other types of things in biomedical or you name it, telecommunications, and we can try to figure out how do we make it real small and, and onto a chip. But w in, able, in doing that, we're able to do uh, different things that you, than you can out of a simple lens. If you think of a simple lens, and the simplest lens that most people can think about is a magnifying glass that you hold and you try to burn ants with and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But with optics, you can take light and you can manipulate it in many different ways. You can take light and you, and you take a single laser beam, which I don't know where this will show up, I put it on the wall there, and it just forms a spot. Right. But by doing this lithographic processing, just like integrated circuits are made, we can take a glass and we can just form a little pattern in the middle of it, and you can pass a laser beam through it, and then you can get a quite different oh, doing. intensity distribution <laughs> on the other side. So now, just from a simple perspective, of you, like when you go to the grocery store and you see a barcode scanner, it forms some kind of arrays of lines across mm -hmm. the package as you as you scan the barcode image, well, we can miniaturize components like that. And then you can think about stacking these wafers up, and yeah, you can have a very complex optical system that is manufactured without any human intervention, human mm -hmm. touching it. Because what's done with a lot of optical systems today is they're all done overseas and stuff with low-skilled labor. They have people sitting around tables, hand assembling stuff. But by bringing this technology to the photonics community, now we can be competitive not only as a nation but as, as a group of people in terms of our research and development, leveraging off the technology infrastructure that exists in the United States today with the IC industry and, and basically making photonic chips just like they do integrate circuits. And we think about other things you need to integrate. You need to integrate the laser source like I showed here, so there's ways to do that. The detection mechanisms, when light comes back, how do I process that light? You can integrate all those things at the chip level also. And then what you do is you basically have a miniature optical system mm. that, that drastically reduces the cost and things like that, which is very important. If photonics is to move from the research side into the consumer marketplace, you have to have cost reductions. And the only way you have cost reductions is getting the human hand out of the right, loop. Right. Um, and the ironic thing is, is that exists already. It exists for the IC industry. It's just a matter of us educating the next generation of engineers and scientists on that technology and saying, here's your platform now, here are your tools, now trade. And so that's what we do at the College of Optics and Photonics mm. that is very unique, in, in my opinion, to what you see in the other centers across the U.S. Mm. That, that focus on optics. So what would be an example of, if you guys were going out and kind of pitching what you do to business right now, what would be an example of a current product they have that you could improve upon with these sort of micro-level optics? Well, Probably the simplest thing to think mm -hmm. of is laser machining. Lasers are, are, yeah. are, are they're, they're popping up everywhere in, in terms of uh, laser welding machines and making mm -hmm. automobiles to medicine. Lasers are, are picking up a lot of interest in medicine, lasers of different wavelengths. But by taking that, that optic that I just showed you that took that beam of light and formed that interesting pattern, well, you can do that for medical applications, mm -hmm. where if you're trying to, to cut an artery or trying to to basically apply treatment to a skin uniformly where you want to spread that laser beam out over a uniform area, places like that. You know, little places that you wouldn't really think about, but by doing it this way, now you have reduced the cost for the practitioner. 
and by doing that puts the technology into their hands right. otherwise it's prohibitive wow that's amazing yeah so what's what's the specific application that you're working on right now um, a lot of different ones yeah. and one of the, and, uh, and when I answer that question I think of the grants that I have and the mm -hmm. diverse range of grants that I have I have one grant that is involving with making high power laser diodes that basically allow you to get even more light out of the diode and put the light where you want it. And that has a lot of applications in, in, in high power laser systems for weapons and medicine and other things like that. Um, some other things I'm involved in is, is, is basically uh, uh, optics for lasers in medicine. Uh, I'm making some optics for people in that area. So um, I also have an NSF grant where I'm trying to say, okay, now how can I take this technology and move it to the next level? And the next level is how do I, how do I synthesize or how do I artificially make butterfly wings, if you want to think of it that way. Mm -hmm. If you think when you look at a butterfly wing, it has this beautiful iridescent color. Well, the color is not real. What happened is light is hitting that surface. It's diffracting light in different ways, and so your eyes will see the beautiful blue and red colors. But now if we can take that technology and we can manufacture that into optical components, mm -hmm then you have the same spectral selectivity that you do in, in nature. Hmm. So one of the areas I'm looking at now is how do I simulate things in nature this way so I can in integrate them in the, in the consumer type technologies. Um, so it really, it's an enabling technology and it's a platform technology that fits in many different ways. And being an optical engineer, you're there to solve problems. So people come to you and say, I think this technology has a place. I'm not sure where it is. Can you help me figure it out? Hmm. And so that's what we do. And then we get the students involved and they learn how to basically one-on-one -on -one engineer with people an application of a technology that, that isn't really sure where it fits, but mm -hmm. ends up finding a place because it's so, it's so powerful and so disruptive in many ways. And you think right now we're about uh, what, 30 years behind in the learning curve from say we're, we're, we're sort of chip technology and that sort of thing? I, think is that what I mean, is it really just at sort of the ground level at this at the, point? It is yeah. at the ground level, and, <clears throat> and if you if you study some of the trends that the photonics industry has gone through, and you look three years ago, the big telecom mm -hmm. boom, the photonics boom they mm -hmm. had there, and you look at what happened, in my opinion, with a lot of their price models, they were based on a lot of their price models on the hand assembly of these systems. Oh. So they could keep the systems at 5000 or 10000 right. or $25,000 right. dollars a pop, whether it was a metropolitan application or whatever, but what they actually found is that there are other ways to do it. If it's that expensive, they're going to go to wireless. They're going to go to other methods. Mm -hmm. So the technology could be used right now if it was here today, mm -hmm. but it, the cost, it's all cost. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of things in technology come down to that. If you're going to hit the higher volume applications, you've got to reduce the cost. I mean, you have to do it differently. You have to think of it differently. Um, so that, that that's really what I yeah. think is, has to happen. So what was what was the experience you had either at Purdue or, or I mean, mm -hmm. somewhere along the undergrad that, uh, line that got you into photonics? What was the aha moment that? Uh, well, uh, well, I spent I spent a number of years working at Martin Marietta here in mm -hmm. Orlando as I did my master's degree in in, in optics because Creel was just starting at the mm -hmm. time in the 80s, um, and I saw the optics as being the next generation mm -hmm. of technology. I was working in radar at the time. Okay. And I, I believed it was going to happen, and so I basically followed hmm. my passion and my, my, my belief that it was going to turn into something. And I don't, I haven't been wrong. I mean, it's you know, I maybe even underestimated yeah. um, where, where where it went. But I think a lot of it was timing and, and seeing the opportunity and seeing seeing the needs. But working in the defense defense industry, I mean, it was so hard to make things and stuff. And 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 I got involved a little bit with lithography there, and then I saw, wow, you know, optics and this, and if we can do optics this way, there's, there's a lot of potential. Mm. And so I followed my passion from mm. that point. And it's, it's led me in a circle to come back yeah. here, which yeah. is somewhat ironic. So what was, Creole started in the mid-80s? I think it's the mid-80s, yeah. yeah. And are they still, I mean, were there people around at the time that kind of envisioned where this was all going? Or, I think or a lot was of, it predictable? A lot of it was, a lot of it was laser research yeah. that was going on here. Um, and, but when I did my doctorate at the University of Alabama, um, there was a small group of people up there playing around in this technology. And that's one of the reasons I went there, because that's where I wanted to, yeah. to get into it. So how are you, um, I mean, obviously Creole with I mean, mm -hmm. building and new facilities and new tools and things all the time. Are you finding it very easy to recruit new talent here? Or is it? still so competitive nationally that that's a well, tough thing to well, do? Personally, it's, it's gotten easier, um, but, the, but since I've been here, the, the College of Optics has, been, has done quite well. Internationally, it has a very, very good reputation, mm -hmm. but certainly when you're a new faculty member coming in somewhere, yeah. you kind of, you know, you, gotta, yeah. you have no equipment, you have no resources, <laughs> you have no other students to show them what you've yeah. been doing. 
and you came in from industry, so it created quite a, an interesting set of challenges. But um, now you know, we, we get top students um, because the facilities we have here are world class, and, and they see that when they get on the internet and things mm -hmm. like that. And then they want to come down and they want to take advantage of the facilities and the people and the activity that's going on here. So I think it's, I think it's gotten a lot easier, but I wouldn't want to say it's easy. We don't have to spend yeah. time on it because you still want the quality. You want to get the quality. You got to put the time into it and make sure that's what happens. Where, where are most of them coming from, your students? Are they, uh, are they mostly in industry already, um, or are they coming directly out of master's most programs? Most of them come actually out of either undergraduate yeah. programs or master's programs, both internationally and in the U.S. And are they coming from optics programs, or are they no. sort of general? Very, very few come from actual optics yeah. programs because very few universities have undergraduate mm -hmm. optics degrees. We get a lot of students in physics uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, engineering are two largest areas, and then we also have some chemistry and then and some other miscellaneous yeah. majors that are sprinkled around there, but predominantly physics and engineering. And then when they show up, are they looking for optics, or are they just looking for good science in some way? And you looking guys happen for to have, yeah, okay. Because a PhD in optics is a, is, is, a, is a very focused discipline. Yeah. So we, in some sense, it helps us recruit people that want to do optics. Right. They're not always sure what area of optics they want to do, yeah. but they come here wanting to do. They optics. come here specifying it's optics. It's not right. something more generally, yeah, right. uh, sort of broadly applied over in, uh, right. in Creole. Yeah. Right. So what else do you do? What else does Creole do besides? Um, Besides optics. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, is, are there these other things that they've sort of branched into um, the last few years, or, or are they, do they stick with a fairly narrow mission? I mean, what are the research areas? Yeah, that really yeah. We cover a lot of different areas from, from, from ultra short pulse technology where they take laser pulses and they try to make them on the order of hundreds of femtoseconds, and there's a lot of very interesting science and technology around that to materials, to growing crystals that, that yeah. allow you to get light um, in, from, from different wavelengths of light by mm. converting it with certain types of crystals, um, to, to laser machining, laser welding, I mean, to glass materials, um, to x-ray optics, um, to infrared optics. Uh, one of our faculty members is actually making in antennas in the infrared. So mm. you think about the antennas you have on your cars and on TV stations and stuff mm. like this. Well, he, you know, Glenn Borman in our department is, is taking that same the same concepts and saying, well, I'm going to make antennas that operate in the optical regime. So, mm. so what you see is is a lot of things that are that are done in other wavelength regimes and radar and other things are being done in optics. But the key is, can you make them small in the material properties? And so there's a lot of research around the materials, the fabrication, the application, the integration of, of optics technology. Mm. So that's why we have people that span the basic science to right. the engineering. Right. In, in diverse backgrounds. And do you have people, I mean, do, as part of your hiring mission, do do you explicitly try to find guys like you that have been in and out of the real world a couple of times so that you can <laughs> have those conversations? Or, or do you have other people on staff over there whose job it is to um, serve as the liaison in between the scientists and the practitioners who are buying this stuff? Well, I, I'm, on a, I'm on a couple search committees, so I'm involved with getting faculty, if I, I guess yeah. that's what you're referring to. Um, I think what we try to do is we try to look for the best people in certain areas that complement our overall program on um, certain technology areas. And if they're, they're from purely academic side, that's fine. But we try to make sure we try to define those people in the area to complement the team and the group of people that we have. Otherwise, we, I don't know what we would have, kind of a mess probably. Yeah. But yeah. Um, So some people have industrial backgrounds like me. We just hired a new assistant professor. Uh, um, that was formerly with Uniroyal Optoelectronics, um, has a lot of industrial background. So we, we kind of have both, and, and that, that having both gives you that blend and that mixture of, of the purely academic and the applied and, and some, some appreciation for what you have to do when you get out and work in the industry. Mm -hmm. So uh, we really have both. So what was, the, what was kind of the triggering event that got you to UCF? Um, I mean, well, it's a big life change, you know. That's it's a big life change, but it's. It, I always wanted to be a professor, um, and and my goal was was I guess it was to do it differently. I was mm -hmm. going to work in industry a while and, and do my doctorate, and then eventually um, become a professor after I had some industrial experience, mm -hmm. um, and so it was always my goal. So by working and doing my doctorate at the same time, I always kept that goal in my mind, and I tried to do the things that were important: publications, research, mm -hmm. involved in societies and doing very well on the industrial side, which, which I was, actually I was an executive prior to coming in. Mm -hmm. So I dealt with a lot of the issues and, and, and it was a goal. So I achieved my goal. And I went, honestly, I just thought it was, it'd be neat to come back to yeah. Creole someday yeah. and, 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 and make an impact and make a difference. And, yeah. 
the opportunity popped up and somebody mentioned it and I said, if I'm going to do it, might as well do it now because otherwise I won't. And so I, I wouldn't do it. Do you have anybody else in your family that was in academic positions? Yes. I talked to lots of people who are professors yes. who had a mom or dad or aunt or uncle or something that was very influential. Who it, it is true. It yeah. is true. I had, had, a, I had a grandmother um, and, and she was a department head at Purdue University. Mm. And ironically, she worked full time while she did her doctorate um, and went in after a number of years of industrial experience. And she mm. came in and she was tasked by Purdue to build the program. Um, and she went in and built the program prior to getting her PhD and did her PhD while she was working there and mm. finished when she was 60 years old. Wow. So she always <laughs> told me, you're never too old yeah, to do it, yeah. but you should work first. And she, yeah. so she kind of told me that that was, that was a good thing to do, a hard thing to do, but we very worthwhile by doing it. And mm. she passed away a few years ago. And, but they had named a building after her up there and stuff. So it's yeah. um, so yeah, she was somewhat of a role model. In had that. you gotten back into the doctoral program at that point? I mean, did she see that? Yeah, that she saw me. Be? She yeah. saw me graduate. Never uh, saw me become a faculty member yeah. though. Oh, that must um, have been great for her though. To, uh, yeah, to but, uh, have that I'm sure kind she of knew I was going to end up there. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's no doubt about it. But uh, oh, that's amazing. Certainly was an inspiration. She was way ahead of her time then. I mean, way ahead of her time. Yeah. way ahead of her time. Yeah. So. So yeah. So what got you then to UCF in particular? Um, I kind of stayed in touch with it. Um, yeah. The reputation um, here at UCF, uh, certainly in the, in the optics department, was growing. Um, but I did look at other faculty jobs, and I had some other offers from from one from a Big Ten university, another from a smaller university. One smaller university actually even offered me tenure prior to coming in. Um, but when I came to to, to UCF in a, in a faculty interview format, um, I saw the opportunity. I mean, I saw the opportunity for growth. I saw the timing that I could come in and I could make a difference in the program in terms of bringing a different technology and a different slant to the program um, where some of the other places.